Question 2 frankly goes to the optician. The above diagram is a simplified anatomy of the eye. Light enters through the transparent cornea at the front uh, and passes through the pupil to the end of the lens. The position of the lens is fixed, however the shape and hence the focal length of the lens can change in order for us to be able to see objects that are far away, distant, as well as objects that are near, close. The lens focuses the light onto the retina where an image of the object is formed. Frankie goes to the optician for an eye examination. The optician shines a ray of light into his cornea at the front of his eye as shown below. Now first point, <coughs> piece of advice for you. This is a very wordy question. There's lots of text and fairly complex diagrams. So uh, if in doubt or if you feel a little bit vague about this, it's worth reading through a couple of times and uh, maybe read through the question at the end to make sure you've answered what, what is there. But anyway, moving on. Nice easy one to start. State the size of the angle of incidence. Um, there is actually a minor calculation because remember the angle of incidence is this one here between the normal and the incoming ray. So uh, it's 90 degrees, that's why it's called a normal. So there's 20 degrees required um, to add to the 70 degrees to make it up. So it's a simple calculation um, state. B, the diagram below shows Frankie's eye looking at a distant object. Um, explain what must happen to the shape of the lens in Frankie's eye in terms of focal length and curvature. So make a note about that. We've got to talk about focal length and curvature if he looks at a nearby object. So rather than a distant object, we're shifting to a nearby object, which means the light rays are going to have to come in on more of an angle like this. Okay, if that's the case, um, that's going to focus the light rays further back because they're coming from a sharper angle and they'll have less time to bend around um, to hit. Um, on the um, light sensitive part of the back of the eye, the retina. Um, so in order for that to happen there's going to have to be a bit of a squishing um, to try and fatten that lens. Okay, As you fatten that lens um, and make it more curved it will allow more, more curvature. You can get into a bit more detail of the, um, the geometry of it um, if you really need to. Um, what does the question suggest? Let's talk about focal length. Um, so the focal length therefore is going to decrease. Um, excuse me, so because it's going to bend the light more so the focal length has to decrease. And the curvature we've talked about increasing. So the curvature is going to increase. And I guess those are the two factors they're looking at um, in, in the situation that you can use a more of a detailed diagram if you like. C. The lens in the eye is surrounded by liquid. Explain what would happen to the focal length of the lens if it was surrounded by air. Um, assume the lens is the same shape. So without changing the lens we've got two situations. We've got a situation where you've got air uh, around the lens and we've got another where you have um, liquid around there and we've given we'd be given the refractive indexes of the uh, liquid and the air the lens is still the same for both so that doesn't affect anything um, so in terms of the focal length of the lens if it's surrounded by by air we've got a greater um, difference between the refractive index of the air and the refractive index of the lens and that's going to cause greater bending so um, greater bending means it has a closer focal length than in the liquid. If we look in the liquid, um, with the liquid sort of around the outside, there's going to be less difference between the refractive index of the liquid and the refractive index of the lens. So it's going to be a further or a longer focal point. Okay. Um, yeah, and you can detail that more as well if you like, with a longer focal point um, it's it's going to be uh, focusing the light further away, just to be really s square and <laughs> straight up I suppose, but um, probably unnecessary at that point. It's a compare and contrast question, it is an excellent question. But anyway, moving on D. The optician looks at the inside of um, Frankie's eye with an instrument that uses red light. This device contains a glass prism like the one shown in the diagram below. The speed of red light in air is the speed of light in anything, doesn't matter the colour. The speed of red light in the gla gla glass prism is there. 
um, and we've got the two refractive indexes. Um, now, the question, after all that mathematical information, it says explain what happens to a beam of red light that shines into the glass prism as shown in the diagram below, be above. You will need to carry out a calculation. Okay, so you need to carry out a calculation to answer this question. Draw the path of the beam of red light to support your answer. Um, so what we would expect with a question sort of like this with prisms is thinking about total internal reflection. And we need to know whether we're going to get um, nice refraction away from the normal or whether we're going to get total internal reflection. So it could be either one or, or two, we're not sure which. Um, so we have to do the calculation to find, um, to find out. The calculation we're going to have to find out, because we know the angle of incidence, we have to find out what the critical angle is um, between the, the prism and the air. And let's just go down to do that. So we're going to use Snell's law to do that. Um, N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. Um, N1 will be, it uh, doesn't matter what we use for N1 and so theta 1 as long as we're consistent that the N1 and the theta 1 are linked. So if we use um, N1 as the air um, and then sine theta 1 as uh, the angle of refraction which would be 90 degrees for the critical angle that's going to give us 1.0 uh, times by sine of 90 degrees which is going to give us 1, sine 90 degrees is 1, so 1 on the left hand side uh, 1.0 equals N2 sine theta 2 N2 is the refractive index of uh, the glass, 1.5 so let's give us that, uh, 1.5 sine theta 2 is going to be the critical angle of the um, prism so we're trying to find the critical angle, we'll rearrange this and it'll become sine to the negative 1, the inverse sine function of 1.0 over 1.5 and that's going to give us an angle of 42 degrees because I'm just having a quick look at the solutions rather than doing the calculation. Um, so 42 degrees, that means there's greater the angle of incidence that we have uh, here is 45 degrees, which is greater than um, the critical angle, which is 42 degrees. So if we go back up, we're going to see that it's not this one. It is, in fact, this one. Number two, so that's our ray that we would draw in there. And there you go.